Now, one of the most dramatic events in Australian history will have an unforeseen impact on the story of the immigration nation. On the 11th of November, 1975, the Governor-General dismisses the Whitlam government. The proclamation which you have just heard read by the Governor-General's official secretary was countersigned Malcolm Fraser. Amidst the controversy, the top job is seized by Liberal leader Malcolm Fraser. Who will undoubtedly go down in Australian history from Remembrance Day 1975 as Kerr's Kerr. It will be the conservative Fraser who writes the final chapter in the story of how the white Australia policy is finally buried. Fraser's first challenge will come when five young Vietnamese men sail into Darwin Harbour. The first few days we get worried and we get scared and worry so much. Don't know where we go, what the life. And after a few more days, we think, don't think too, too far away. We have enough fuel, water, food. So we keep going. His future under threat, 19-year-old Tak Tam Lam flees the communist regime in Vietnam. With four friends, he escapes onto the high seas. Using nothing but a school atlas to guide them, they fearlessly consider sailing thousands of kilometers to Australia or America. American people, no friendly people. We know during the Vietnam War, we know. So on the Australian Army is very friendly, we know, yeah. Fond memories of Australian soldiers convinced the boys to head here. After two months at sea, they finally make it to Darwin Harbour. Pulling up next to a prawn trawler, they ask local fishermen what to do. There's a call the police, public forms there. So my, my brother, we don't have money. Uh, so they, they give my, my brother 10 cent there. Girl call there. <laughs> yep. So uh, my brother got to make the phone call to call the police. And my fisherman, uh, my friend's fisherman, he died for three weeks, no cigarette on the boat. And so the fisherman smoked, he, so he, with the body leg, we asked him to <laughs> cigarette. And the fisherman showed the whole pack of cigarette to him and said, yeah, for you. Yeah. So he said, oh, Australia people are very good, eh? Only one, but they give whole packet. <laughs> I mean, very good country. That's the, that's the country we like. <laughs> the locals may be welcoming, but immigration officials are panic-stricken. The authorities think even five boys and one boat could cause public alarm. In his latest mission, Wayne Gibbons is ordered to Darwin to hush things up. But well, we kept the arrival of the boat, that first boat, um, into Darwin um, as low-key as we could. We didn't want to spook Australians boat arrivals directly into Australian territory risked creating an atmosphere that things were out of control. When the Australian public feels things are out of control, they generally turn against immigration. The government has managed to keep this first arrival under wraps. But just two years later, Prime Minister Fraser faces a crisis on an entirely different scale. There are now hundreds of thousands of refugees fleeing Vietnam, and several hundred boat people have already made it to Darwin. Vietnamese refugee boat number 48 arrived in Darwin yesterday with 113 people on board. Immigration department officials have completed preliminary checks on the refugees and are now awaiting a decision on whether they'll be taken to a quarantine station 
for detailed health and immigration procedures. Meanwhile, the refugees remain on their listing boat, which will eventually join the dozens of others lying in and around the Darwin Harbour. Canberra dispatches Wayne Gibbons to Malaysia to set up refugee camps and stop the boats from coming directly to Australia. You would see them arrive with no standing room on the deck, and that looked awful. But when you opened the hatch and looked below, and you saw hundreds, sometimes, of people just stacked like sardines, literally like sardines. There was no room to move. How people survive those journeys was amazing. The exodus from Vietnam shows no sign of slowing down. The Nguyen family fought against the communists. Now, like many others, they must flee. We were listed as the public enemy number one. We are the most dangerous elements of the new society. We are uh, scoundrels, we are scum of the earth, and we must be sent to labor camps. That is when mom decided that at any cost, we must escape. Like all Vietnamese, Fong's family are forbidden from leaving the country. But the government is pushing out the ethnic Chinese. And so the Nguyen's assume false identities and escape on a packed ship. Mum was carrying with us nothing but a little statue of Our Lady. It was, that's it. And, and nothing, no clothing, just what we wear. And we're leaving our country. But the only thing is I'm happy if we die, if we perish, at least we, at the whole family, we die together. For the developing countries of Southeast Asia, the influx of hundreds of thousands of refugees is an intolerable economic burden. But with a start July 1979, and there are now 400,000 refugees in Southeast Asia looking for a new home. Malcolm Fraser has a momentous decision to make. If he opens the doors, he not only risks the backlash of a deeply fearful nation, he will overturn an ideology that has barred Asians from Australia for more than 70 years. If Malcolm Fraser had decided that he wouldn't take Indo-Chinese refugees until he had consulted opinion polls or focus groups, he would never, and Australia would never have taken Indo-Chinese refugees. But Malcolm Fraser didn't take polls. He decided that leadership was essential. It was something that Australia had to do, morally justified, and it would be the benefit of this country if we did so. In July 1979, Fraser agrees to take 14,000 Indo-Chinese refugees. Ultimately, 70,000 will settle here during his time as Prime Minister. Fong Nguyen's family arrive into Adelaide at Christmas in 1979. Everything was so strange, everything was so different. But on the other hand, we are so glad, we are so relieved from the refugee camp to finally, this is our new home. In, in my mind, there's no doubt that the decisions made by Fra the Fraser government literally changed the face of Australia. We had never had such an injection of Asian migrants to the country, uh, not since the gold rush days. I think their acceptance and their settlement is one of the great success stories of, of Australian migration history. It was the Fraser government's decision to allow tens of thousands of refugees from uh, Vietnam to come to Australia that really marks the end point of the white Australia policy. 
the watershed event of the Vietnamese refugee crisis has never been repeated. But for the past 30 years, the agenda has still been dominated by stories of unplanned arrivals. The arrival of the Tampa, we will decide who comes to this country and the circumstances in which they come. China has no obligation under international law. Australians are concerned when they see boats on our horizon and they want to make sure that the government is actively managing to protect our borders. Boat people remain one of Australia's great fears. Although the arrival of unauthorised boats of asylum seekers has always generated extraordinary angst and extraordinary media coverage, the actual numbers coming to Australia have been tiny in absolute terms, in, on averages, however you want to look at it. Since the Vietnamese refugee crisis, around 20,000 boat people have arrived in Australia. At the same time, more than three and a half million immigrants have made their home here, without provoking comment and largely with great success. We're a country of migrants. They've transformed the country and we're indebted to them for the great contribution that they've made in helping us to overcome, to some extent, the social suffocation, the insularity, which has bedeviled us as an island country. Australia's probably been as successful as any country in the world uh, in managing its immigration programs and in bringing together a very broad range of different national groups while maintaining harmony to a very large extent. But in celebrating the success of Australia, to never lose sight of the reality of the difficulties and the tensions and the conflicts uh, necessarily involved in mass migration. It's still work in progress. But Australia has made a remarkable journey since 1901, when its political leaders passed draconian laws to protect the dream of a white nation. It's taken a century and more of struggle. But the immigration nation we live in today has been achieved against the odds. We started the century with a, a massive contradiction. You know, these universal values of freedom and tolerance and fairness, but they're being restricted to whites only and white Brits only. Now, finally, in the last 20, 30 years, we've got these still these same core Australian values and characteristics, you know, but now they're not being restricted to any one race or set. Now, anyone from any continent of the world is able to come to Australia and participate in that. And so it's the final realisation of the dream that was begun by a very different set of people with a very different set of, you know, of ways of seeing the world back in 1901. For an interactive version of the Australian immigration story,